actually a trained photographer. I'm actually a painter. I was trained as a painter. But <coughs> as a means or as an entry point through which I sort of um, inquire into my own practice as an artist. And these two works you see here are some of my early works, but I'm almost not recognized as the creator of them, probably because of the ways in which my practice has sort of shifted and how it's sort of developed into what it is now. Um, so, um, as a trained you know, artist, obviously I studied the um, basic elements and principles of you know, drawing and painting. And once I thought I could use those um, basic elements and principles of drawing and painting, and I thought I considered myself as an artist then. But funny enough, um, I got to realize that I was very um, wrong in terms of the thoughts that I had um, in relation to the responsibilities of artists. So I got to realize that there was a bigger, you know, responsibility that. Um, that comes with the title of artist when I was in my <coughs> second year at my BA um, course, like on my BA course um, back in Ghana. So I studied painting um, in K University, which is Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And when I go to my second year, I was sort of challenged by my professors to um, go out there and try to find a voice. But when I discovered the early works, this style, which is something that I came about with, like in terms of the sketches, <coughs> filling in some gaps and trying to create presentations that sort of like um, broke the boundaries of foregrounds and backgrounds. And so, with this, I felt like I had discovered myself. But when I was put to that challenge, I was like, okay, then if this is another challenge, because I'm, I'm, I'm a person who really likes challenge, so I thought I'll put this aside for a while and then get into my. Um, interest in going outside there to sort of find a new voice and see what you know the potential would be. So um, I quickly went to town to market places, um, started interviewing people, um, market women, um, hawkers on the streets, um, hustlers, drug addicts, um, you know, uh, people who were in offices, you know, doing all sorts of things. So I I raided into every space trying to understand why people did what they did. And one thing that was very much interesting for me is these um, materials <coughs> on the side of the road. So this is like the Ghanaian calendars. Um, they are very, very fascinating in terms of how they are sort of presented. Um, and they have shifted from the conventional calendars that we know of, which represents days and times into just materials that sort of have on them documented images. And so for me, it, it was very much interesting because I would see it in every space that I went into. So from offices to um, institutions to um, schools, hospitals, people's <coughs> private <coughs> people's bedrooms, um, people's stores and kiosks. So I questioned myself why they kept all those calendars. And the fact about the calendars is that the moment you enter into a space, you would see um, the affiliation of the person who is the owner of the space. So say you go into a church, you would see um, a calendar of Jesus Christ and um, you know all the saints and stuff like that. If you, if you go into an office, say, um, a cocoa production company's office. You see their calendar with cocoa on it, you know, talking about the kind of products that they sort of produce. If you go into, say, um, people's private homes, you'd see their political affiliations, and also you'd see their um, economic status, and all these things like sort of represented in the calendars that they keep. And one interesting thing also about the calendars is the fact that when time pushes the use of these calendars off track, they are not discarded. So they are sort of like kept, and years after years, people stack, you know, calendars on top of each other. So you go into someone's, you know, house and you see like 1950 um, calendar, say 1990 calendar, 
up to say 2011 or 2012, and some people would see from 2015 to say 2019. So it was very much fascinating, but um, through the conversations that I had with these people, um, I realized that the underprivileged people in the Ghanaian community were very much drawn to, they were more critical about the object itself. They were very much, um, you know, they, they had a very academic approach to the calendars rather than the people who are so-called, you know, like scholars or academics. So the academics understood that calendars are meant to resent days and times. So when it's 2019 and 2020 comes, they throw it away. But the underprivileged people, like the uneducated, unformal educated people, would keep the calendars. And for me, the conversations, um, the kind of um, ideas they were telling me was that it is the only way that they are able to sort of keep track and keep records of what has happened in the past. So they kept it as a sort of archive to sort of create a library for the kids to understand how the system has transformed through, you know, the um, the layers of time, in a sense. So this is a picture I took in, in, in one of the market spaces. And you can see how these, um, you know, people bumping into people, people bumping into machines, people coming into contact with other people's sweats, um, the color clash, the rhythm, and also like the, the chaos in itself, which in a way creates this kind of beautiful aesthetic that I thought, uh, you know, I could actually sort of dig into. So this is also one of the images of the map. Um, my, my, my PowerPoint is quite, like the presentation is quite long, but due to the, um, the lack of time, I will sort of show some pictures without explaining them, so there will be. Um, So this is like uh, a temporary um, store or a temporary space where someone sells examples of the calendars. So this is actually a place where people are selling calendars. And interestingly, when you look around <coughs> the whole composition, you can realize that there are also other posters that are not being sold, but they are also there being represented in a sense. So that idea of like um, looking and sort of <coughs> sampling what you see and making sense of that is where my my language of you know photography and, and, and how that can be transformed into contemporary issues set in. Now, my understanding um, of photography as an African artist and as also you know a scholar has always been something that is quite problematic. Because growing up, I understood photography in a way that um, that was very much challenging for me. In terms of like, I would go to libraries trying to find histories of my people and the kind of histories that were documented photographically were, were, were histories that I, I couldn't really see myself in. Because the Africa that I knew and the kind of um, places that I was intervening were very much different from the kind of um, images that were documented by colonial, you know, um, so-called colonial masters or whatever. Yeah, so um, I had to really find a way to dig, to excavate, and also to find for myself, you know, um, and really create an understanding of Africa that I could really uh, you know, come to terms with, and also find a way that I could set that into my practice. So, um, I took cameras out there, and one funny thing is that when you when you go into places trying to, you know, sort of in, in interview people and you know take pictures with camera, I, I understand that they had also come to terms with the fact that it could be used as a weapon to sort of create some distraction. So people would shy away from you know people with cameras. They wouldn't want you to take pictures of them because. They thought there was a potential of you using it in a way that they never thought it could be used. So, because histori hist historically we've all seen how that has sort of transformed into, you know, stereotypical ideas and, you know, how it has sort of created separation in, in cultures and in, 
in, in, in, in class and in, you know, in education and stuff like that. So I had to, I had to create relationships with people. My practice, the, the main point, the main essence of my practice now is the fact that it is community based. So due to the, the kind of um, processes that I go into, I can't just imagine me come knocking your door and say, hey, can I come in to take pictures of you know your, your images or calendars or you know uh, your family album pictures and stuff like that. It was it's impossible. I tried that in the UK and <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you know, someone almost, almost called the police on me. You know, it's, it's, it's really cool. But the whole essence is that you have to create relationships with these people for them to really trust your 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 research um, 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 process and also trust what you stand for as an individual and also as a scholar who is going to use something of this, something as private or as public to create, you know, something that will be assessed by Mundo School. So, um, these are examples of the calendars. So this is like a calendar that depicts um, cultural, I'm um, sorry, um, fashion trends. So um, it was taken in a, in a tailor shop and you can see how it's been stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Even some of them are torn but they are taped, you know, just to still go with the elm to them. Mm -hmm. And also the idea of display was very much interesting for me because when I was entering into all these places, I was, I, so I've seen rooms of extremely rich people in Ghana and also extremely poor people in Ghana, like people's bedrooms. I, I, I've seen rooms that people are literally lying in, in say, in, in sand with just the max. And I've seen rooms that are very much sophisticated to a point where people are sort of like lying in like water lying on water beds and you know people are having these big jacuzzis and stuff like that. So, you know, so that kind of like push and pull and contradiction sort of affected me as a creator, as an artist. So my display and the kind of ways in which I approach the idea of making is very much, you know, within that kind of push and pull. <coughs> So yeah, this is a man I met that I call family now. I never knew, but through you know the research processes, I've come to know him in a very beautiful way. This image as well was taken from the northern part of Ghana, and you know it's it's very much iconic, and the ways in which it's sort of like placed is it's almost placed in a in a very advantageous position where it cannot be um, ignored in a sense. So even my grandmother. When I was growing up, you know, she she had a very important wall within her bedroom where images, because she was Catholic, so she had like images of different Catholic calendars of Jesus Christ, of Saint Anthony, and all these saints and stuff like that. So um, it was the moment you enter into the house, into the the room, like the the, the wall opposite you is where that is, and you dare not hang anything on, on her calendar because it was very much important for her. For her, it would chase away um, <coughs> demons and spirits and also it would set us in a space where we begin to consider our, our life and make you know, good use of our life. It was like the religion um, was sort of shaping us in a sense, which it did. It's also a different type of calendar that um, depicts trends in hairstyles and hair designs. And you can see how beautiful the is. <coughs> but the place in which I took it is in, in contradiction to it. You know, so this is that calendar. And this is this is like an outside barbering shop. <laughs> you know, where after he started this guy and say um, the authority comes in and say, hey, you guys move there. Because that place is like an illegal spot for trade. So he can easily take his mirror and take his stuff and put it in his bag and walk off. You know, and when he gets to a place where peace is, he can set up again and you know start barbering again. So that idea of also, you know, making quick gestures, sorry, quick gestures just to, you know, survive, you know, mood for survival also is something that I look at 
um, through photography and through my practice as an artist. Now, talking about display, you know, and 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 um, layering. Um, when I when I realized how things were sort of juxtaposed and superimposed and layered, and the kind of flashes and the kind of beauty that emerged out of that, I I was I was very much aware that I could, there was no way that I could really translate my ideas as an artist without having to um, borrow the concept of collage, because it was very much evident in all the spaces that I had grown up in, even in terms of that Ghana that I came out of, or that I am in. You know, that Ghana in itself is a collage. It is a Chinese Ghana, in terms of how Ghana deals with, you know, economical, economic situations with China. You know, it is um, a British Ghana, in terms of how, you know, even my educational system was very much British. Um, I studied um, with, I studied um, art from the reverse. So my art history was like a Western history before I even got to understand, you know, the African art history in a sense. So like, you can really tell where I'm coming from. And also, um, it is an American Ghana in terms of how the youngsters sort of um, borrow um, the gangs, the gang cultures in America, and also like even the hip hop dressing and stuff like that. So yeah, it's not really the Ghana that was documented in all those historical archives that I was seeing, I realized that it was actually connected <coughs> to all the periphery, all parts of you know the world. And so this is also another store where the great hairs and yeah, these are all parts of the calendars. They have no dates on them, but yeah, they are calendars. And working in town also comes with surprises. <laughs> yeah, so there are times that you know you, you 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 chance upon things that are not very much in line with what you are doing, but you you can't. It's, it, it, it creates an image that you can't really do away with, so you have to sort of have it with you. And this is one of them. Um, I have many of them, but yeah, this is one image that sat with me for a long time, and I thought it was very much interesting in terms of the composition in itself. And the conversations I had with these people were very much enlightening. So fast forward, um, I come back to my studio, I have all these um, huge collection of um, image archives and I have nothing to do with them. So I started printing them out because there is this thing that you know soft um, and hard copies also does to you. Like when you are looking at image from a screen, it's very much different from mm -hmm. holding it in your hands and like gazing at it. So I thought it was, a, it was very important that I print them out. And when I printed them out, you know, the idea of uh, collage setting. So this is like an early studies I did with some of the images I collected. Mm -hmm. At that time, Osama had been killed, um, and you know, there were calendars produced. Um, Gaddafi as well, you know, and all these things were going on. So I, I decided to create some kind of, you know, um, contradictory um, um, compositions that um, spark conversations basically. So there's actually a very iconic um, pose of Jesus Christ, you know, like with his hands on his chest, pointing to the hat and then, you know, one hand um, pointing at the top. And then I, you know, sort of put some of the learning space in there just to sort of see how that would, um, the kind of friction it would create. But I thought that it was very much important that I really dig deep into the idea of collage. So I, um, this, um, I started a series called A Collective Consciousness of Space and Time. And at that time, I was very much interested in like, bringing all these sampled cultures and all these sampled histories and experiences of people that I had no connection with um, into my work. And, and also put myself within those works to see how that really works and how that works. So these are some of the early works that I made. And then also, um, 
from my BA course, I had the opportunity to go to China to study. I was actually in, um, tired of the research that I was doing at, to a point, so I wanted something challenging, more challenging, so I decided to travel to China to, 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 to sort of put myself to a test. Mm -hmm. So even when I was going to China, I knew not a single word in Chinese, not even how to say hi. But um, that challenge was sort of proven to be a very important one when I actually set my foot in China. You know, the ways in which I had to um, also put myself in the position of like some of the um, street workers in Ghana, like just to survive in a different land was a very much interesting thing for me because I had to even um, develop ways to speak or communicate with people without having to use words. And, and that in itself was, um, you know, it, it was very much fulfilling in a sense. <coughs> but when I was in China, um, I was, but when I was in China, I was very much um, challenged um, because this idea of sampling different cultures and trying to find a place as an artist within, you know, the, the history of representation in itself and how you can sort of create a space where your practice fits. Was, was very much um, alive back in China because it was, it was that place where I was sort of lost. I was put within, I was out of place in a sense, but I was also in place because I had been creating relationships there, but I had also some, I had less access to what I would normally get back home. But, um, so I had, I started making connections with the gods started creating like similarities and differences. And I realized that it was actually not so much different from the Ghana I knew. Because when I was going to China, my cousins were even telling me that, oh, by the time you are back, you will be, you'll be very much good in karate and stuff like this. So I, you know, but it was, when I went there, I never even saw anyone. I traveled a lot when I was in China, but I never even saw a friend who knew how to, you know, the martial arts. And it was interesting in terms of how back home films and photography had created just stereotypes about, about China. So this, I, I think there is a need that, you know, ev every one of us in this room go back with um, an understanding that one has to excavate and one has to try to find for him or herself truth about what is already historically documented. Because there is always an aspect, a back door, and you know, um, a point of departure that are sort of gapped or closed by the canon of the person that creates all these things. Because everyone has interest. The moment you pick up a camera, the idea of editing sets in. You know, I can take a, 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 a picture and try to capture this room, but I would focus on something. That thing that I focus on. It's not the absolute truth about the whole space. I can photograph this part of the room, but there are other parts, other people in the same room, you know, that I might leave out. And even if I don't leave out and I photograph them as well, they are not within the first image that I took. And therefore, if anyone comes to that image and tries to interrogate that image or try to find the truth in it, there is a path that is lost. And so that we all have a baggage to sort of like go back and excavate and try to find truth and understanding for ourselves. So yeah, that would be my, the end of my presentation. But I would like to skip through to, to show you the kind of ways that came out of the images that I sampled. And I love, I love the idea of scale. So all my works are huge, like 1.2 meters by 2 meters. You know, they are not small scale because scale is not, it's not, um, for me, it is considered a material. It, it, it creates a huge impact in whatever you create. You know, even in terms of the kind of energy you put into the work that you do, and uh, also the kind of um, statement or the language it presents to the audience, in a sense. Color is also a very important thing for me. Because like it is a way of me trying to limit the chaos within my work. 
because mm. these images are sampled from various places. So like, yeah, um, yeah, I'll just skip through the images and put them on the website. There are, you know, stories obviously to the website, which I, due to the lack of time, I won't, I won't be able to explain. Mm. These uh, archives that I dig into from the British um, Museum's archives and you know the British Library archives to talk about the history of you know the Rembrandt generation to the UK and the kind of relationship between <coughs> them and how my understanding and my place within the UK also sets in. But yeah, I will, I will skip through. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. 